Welcome to Transformational Educational Technologies. My name is Dr. Jason Zagami, and I'll be leading you through this course as we explore a range of educational technologies and how they can transform educational organizations. Now, this week, we're going to be starting with change research. The area of research that is undertaken to explore changes in organizations and the various methodologies that we can use to conduct such research. So we're going to be using what's called a systems lens, looking at it as a system. And we'll explore what systems mean in future sessions. And we're going to be examining a range of particular research methodologies that assist us in this process, particularly around educational technologies. Design-based research, um, where we will be using that to analyze educational organizations. We're going to develop some simulations, and we're going to explore the interactions that occur within an organization in relation to educational technologies. Then you're going to develop some policy frameworks that enable such processes to be enacted within educational organizations. And finally, you're going to develop an implementation plan that will aim to transform an organization around their use of educational technologies. So that's the overall framework of the course. Now, change is an important aspect of life. We all experience change as we develop and grow and mature. But in educational organizations, it's inherently difficult because education by its nature is often very conservative. It wants to replicate societal values and norms and experiences because that's the purpose of education. It's to transfer knowledge and understanding and processes from one generation to another. So there are challenges around enacting change to an inherently conservative um, organization. But educational technologies have been found to be quite effective as being a catalyst for such change. Now, a catalyst is something that we add to something to help it change. So we often see changes, particularly around pedagogy, ways of teaching, through the use of educational technologies. So the technologies may not necessarily be the most important part. It's the other changes that are implemented by introducing educational technologies. And we're going to look at some ways of studying this. Um, we're going to use design-based research that has a socio-ecological modeling um, foundation. And we'll explore that in, again, future weeks. Then we're going to develop um, some models of these educational environments. And we're going to simulate those and going to create a computer simulation of your organization. Then you're going to develop some vision statements, goals and policies and procedures that would be put in place to enable the changes to occur. And finally, we're going to use action research around what's called and policy oriented research around developing a transformation plan to enable an organization to move from where it is to where it could be using educational technologies as a catalyst for that change. OK, so the two main course aims are the, to develop a research informed strategies to lead transformational change in educational organizations. And secondly, around policy development experience to support organizational changes. So that's what you, we aim to have developed the capacity for you to do at the end of this course. And a number of learning outcomes associated with those. So firstly, you're going to learn how to apply a design-based research approach using socio-ecological modeling to analyze an educational organization. Then we're going to use a systems engineering research to develop a dynamic simulation model that will allow you to analyze your educational organization in more detail. You're then going to use action research to develop policies that support the implementation of educational technologies and then apply policy oriented research to develop an organizational transformation strategy. And finally, you're going to demonstrate an understanding of a range of research or informed educational transformation approaches. So 
that's in more specifics is what you're to learn throughout this course. Now, many of these terms and concepts are going to be a bit strange for you at the moment, but they'll certainly become much clearer as we go through the various sessions. And if you knew it all already, then you would need to do the course. OK, so the course is structured around four units, each of three weeks in duration. Um, in the first unit, we focus on design based research where you're going to apply a design-based research approach using socio-ecological modeling and demonstrate an understanding of a range of research-informed transformation approaches. OK, now in this particular session, this week, you're going to develop an understanding of action research, design research, design-based research, which is different, um, in relation to educational technologies research. I think there's a couple more in there as well. And through that, you'll better understand systemic design in researching educational technologies, the ways we go about doing research around these various concepts. Oops. Okay. So in terms of assessment for the course, two assessment items, but they're broken into subtasks. There's going to be a log of learning activities and a portfolio of learning. Log of learning activities is worth 20% and the portfolio of learning is, is worth 80%, but it's broken into four 20% tasks. So your log of learning activities. Now, these are what are called completion activities. You just have to do them and you'll receive some marks. So nice, easy marks if you do the activities on time. You have to do them, though. Um, by the set time frame. So there'll be an online quiz each week, just a very short quiz on the content of the material that you've been learning about. And you can do that quiz as many times as you want. It will count the highest grade of all the attempts that you've made. And then, and that you can keep doing throughout the course. Um, although it makes sense though to do, the, do it as we go. Um, if you leave them all to the end, You've got to remember back 12 weeks to be able to um, think about what you learned in that first week. So do them as you go, and they're relatively trivial to complete. Leave them till the end, it gets much more onerous. And then you've got what we call contributions to online discussion. Now, we have, we're using the Teams-based environment, and in that there is a forum for discussion. And if you make contributions to that, then you receive marks. Now, I need to be able to collect those contributions, or you need to be able to collect them and submit them, and that is done through Learning at Griffith. So while you make the contributions to Teams to ferment our discussion and, and all the rest, you then um, copy and paste those into a submission point in Learning at Griffith, and that has to be done um, for each module. So you have to have done the ones for the first three weeks by, I think, week four. And then the ones for the weeks three to six by week seven. Um, you can't leave those till the end. You have to make your discussion contributions as we go. Otherwise, we don't have all the discussion in the last week of the course. Um, it just doesn't make sense doing it that way. So that again will contribute towards your marks and nice easy contributions now they do have to be what we call substantive discussions um, they have to add something new or introduce a new idea or concept or answer a question um, and i give you prompts in each of the sessions and the course content material um, as to what you could contribute to teams so i'll give you ideas as we go just to help you in case you are struggling to Think of how you can contribute to the discussion. But you can also reply to other people's points. Um, now, it can't just be a trivial th thing such as I agree. You have to make some sort of substantive contribution. So argue something or add some ideas or um, suggest some resources. Um, and then as long as you make some contribution, you gather those up and you submit those. And there'll be more details on the course website around that. Um, that's pretty much what I've said. Okay, 
So that was the um, log of learning activities. Now we have the portfolio of learning. Your portfolio of learning has four tasks, one for each module. Um, and they need to be, again, submitted by weeks four, seven, 10, and 12. So essentially a week after each module. Um, and the advantage of doing this is if you fail a task, you can then resubmit it. Now it has to be a fail. You have to get lower than 50% for the task. And if you resubmit, you can only go up to 50%. But it gives you an opportunity, if you really bomb out on it, to redo it and get to 50%. Um, now, you can do that for the first three portfolio items. The last one, the presentation, you can't do it. Um, of course, it's the end of the course and it messes up all the timings if that happened. So you can, though, submit your portfolio of learning all at the end. Again, I don't advise it. The course is structured around supporting you in doing each of these tasks as we go. But if you run out of time or things happen, you can leave them till the end. But if you do, you don't then have the opportunity to resubmit and get that feedback. OK, so it's your portfolio of learning tasks are four tasks that we do during the course, and they're very much scaffolded around the activities and learnings that you'll be doing. The first one is you're going to develop a design-based research proposal. Then you're going to develop a system simulation, an organizational policy. And finally, you're going to do, you're going to present your transformation plan. Now, this can either be done live during the tutorial, which is the preferred mode. Um, and in that case, you don't have to submit anything. You just do the presentation. Or you can do it as a submitted video at the end. Um, so that's the four elements of the portfolio. And then you've got your quizzes and your discussion contributions, which make up your log of learning activities. And that's the assessment for the course. OK, so this week we're looking at some various research approaches that relate to transformational educational technologies. Now, the first of these is action research. You may have heard of it before. Um, Action research seeks to make a change. It's the action is a key word in there. It represents change. So it's a transformational change through a process of taking an action and doing research. And it's linked to critical reflection around those processes. Now, it's often done around a particular problem or issue happening in an organization. And it's very often done with um, or as practitioners. So. Teachers often do action research when they do their research masters. Um, of course, it is something they can relate directly to things that are happening in their teaching. They find a problem and they research it. They research how to improve it or how to make changes, things of that nature. Um, so it generally contributes to practical concerns of immediate problematic situations. Um, and it's often very much related to social science goals around improving um, equity and access and um, opportunities in learning. And it's generally done in collaboration um, with a researcher and a practitioner. Or, as I mentioned, sometimes they can be the same, um, teachers as practitioners or as researchers. Um, and it provides benefits not only to the research community in terms of getting a better understanding about the problem and the issues that are being researched, but also directly to the practitioner, directly to the people involved. It's generally solving a, an applied problem that they want to improve upon. So this sort of gives a bit of an idea of the cycles that happen in action research. Um, identify a question and a, and a plan. You take some sort of action. You then collect evidence and analyze that and reflect upon what's happened as a result of that action. And then you go through another cycle. You come up with a new plan of how to improve things further, take the action, collect evidence and analyze it, reflect upon it, and then so forth, and repeat that cycle as many times as needed. And that's called iteration or iterative improvement. So there's a video that you can watch that explains this in more detail, and you'll find that on the course website.
OK, so action research can be applied in three main spectrums. Around can be driven by a researcher agenda, what a researcher wants to find out, and they go and find some teachers or practitioners, and they agree to undertake the research together. Or it can be driven by the practitioners, where the teachers or the principal or school admin or whatever um, comes to a researcher and says, we want to explore this issue, this problem. How can we do this together and research it and come up with an answer around it? It can also be motivated by some sort of goal. It might be around improving test scores or improving retention or attendance. Um, and this can often be related to some sort of transformation in the organization. It might be improving their use of technology. Um, and then finally, there are what we call first to second to third or third person research processes. The first is researching your own actions, how you go about teaching, for example, then researching group actions, how the school or the department goes about teaching. And then finally, looking at what's called scholarly research, looking at things on a large scale or more generalizable. So looking at how teaching itself happens. Um, and different action research projects can be framed in different ways, and sometimes they can generate through those different stages. So again, it's a result of going through a cycle of planning where we have some sort of input, an action, which is a transformation, and then we have results or output, which informs the next stage of the cycle. Another way of depicting it is through planning, action, and results. And we have various feedback loops looking at how they impact upon one another. OK, so another set of stages around action research are diagnosis, action planning, action taking, evaluation, and then specifying learning, or what we've learned from that process, and how we can specifically then uh, feed that understanding back into the next cycle. And another little cyclical diagram showing that process. All essentially the same process. They're all action research, just um, interpreted in slightly different ways in how they're presented. OK, so what I'd like you to do is to post to teams what you feel is the difference between action research and more traditional experimental research. Now, experimental research is generally where we um, do what's called pre-post test. We take some measurement before we do something, we do something, and then we take a measurement afterwards and we see what effect um, that doing something has had. So see if you can think through what differences there might be between that in terms of traditional experimental research and what we've just described as action research. There are a few readings for you to do. Uh, there's three readings uh, for this week. Um, this is the first two, and you'll find links to those on the course website. And again, having read those, post to Teams what you see is the difference between action research and design research. And we're going to now explore design research. OK, so design research is again using an iterative approach where we build and evaluate activities to develop an artifact. Now, the artifact is the key thing here. We're actually designing something. Something has to come out of it that's tangible. It may be a lesson. It might be a video. It might be an educational application, a website, um, a game. But something has to be produced. So we often use design-based research or design research um, when we're exploring the creation of something. Um, so it may be um, implementing electronic whiteboards in an organization and then looking at how we've designed them to fit into various locations and the lighting and the um, where they're spaced and placed and all the rest. So generally, we go through the iterative process of looking at how things are being developed. Um, we rarely develop something and it's perfect the very first time we go through several stages of improvement. And that's what we mean by that iterative process. Um, so it's designed, 
and then refined through an iterative pro process of prototyping, testing, and evaluation. It goes again through some stages, uh, identifying the problem and the motivations of why we're trying to address this particular problem, defining the objectives for the solution, what is going to be an effective solution, what are we trying to get out of this process. We then design and develop some sort of artifact as part of that. We demonstrate it or use it and put it into place. We then evaluate it and then communicate that evaluation. So unlike action research, design research does not generally require theorizing. We're not focused on trying to work out why things are happening. We're simply trying to produce something as best as we can. Um, so it's somewhat of a different focus to action research, which is very much trying to understand a problem and a situation. Design research is very much around creating something and creating it as best as we can. Then we have a thing called practice research. It's a combination of the two, design and action research. Now, again, it's um, divided into two aspects, the researcher and um, the practitioner. And the researcher is looking at what's called situational inquiry. They're looking at a particular situation and what's happening. So how the practitioner is doing something, how they're teaching something, how they're creating an object or an artifact, um, what they're doing. The practitioner is much more focused around the creating the artifact or solving the problem or doing something. Um, and again, it's focused on creating an artifact. So that's where it, it differs from um, action research, but it's not as focused as design research. So it's still looking at how and why things are happening. Um, now, there are debates over its applicability uh, because it's very specific to one circumstance. It's very hard to generalize such research and say, OK, this is what we found out about how Sue Smith developed a lesson, a lesson on teaching um, ancient Egypt and created this model of a pyramid and all the things that happened around that, um, because it's very much related to that one specific instance. So it's not very generalizable to a lesson, say, in art or in geography. But there may be things that we learn from it. And that's what makes it valid, valid research. OK, then we have one called design based research. Now, this is different to design research. Um, this is DBR. This is design based research. Now, this comes out of the learning sciences. And it's very much around developing solutions to problems and measuring how well they work. But they're very much educational problems. So this is sort of a subset of the other types of research, focus on educational issues that teachers often face all the time. Um, so it's around improving educational practice. And again, it's iterative. It goes through that cycle. And it's very contextually sensitive. So it's generally for a particular class, for a particular group of students, um, particular time of year, particular content that's being taught, and how to maximize the educational value of that particular activity. Um, but it does use a set of analytical techniques, and it tries to bridge theory and practice in education, looking at the theoretical elements of why things are happening and relating those to what's done in the classroom. So it's a great opportunity for teachers who don't necessarily interact a lot with educational theory to explore the particular theories as they apply to their practice in a particular circumstance. And looks at how, when and why educational innovations work in, work in practice. And so we often use these around educational technologies and looking very much around the relationships between theory, the artifacts that are being designed, and the practices being employed by the practitioner or the teacher in this case. Okay, so design-based research um, is focuses on the influences of the context. Um, 
where it's been contextualized, the particular classroom, the students, the content being taught, um, it all sets up a particular context. And then it's exploring the emergent and complex outcomes from all of those interactions. We all know that teaching and learning is a very messy space. It's really hard to define it down to a set of specific variables and do really experimental research on it. It's a really messy, complex environment, any classroom or any learning interaction. And so design-based research is an attempt to try to allow that complexity to flourish and to see how things emerge from that. But it, ass it assumes an incompleteness of knowledge about all of these elements. Many of our other research processes try to build a theory that explains everything around a particular something in educational practice. Design-based research assumes that we're never going to get to that stage. It's just too messy, too complex, but we can still learn a lot by delving in and trying to understand as best we can what's happening. Okay, so some aspects of design-based research. Um, it's looking at the nature of learning in a particular context. It's studying the phenomenon in real world situations, and it's going beyond narrow measures of learning and looking at all the interconnected complexity of what's happening. And there's a need to derive things from what's called formative evaluation, not somewhat different to summative and formative as we see in assessment. That formative evaluation is where we're still evaluating things without them coming to a conclusion. Um, we're not waiting till the end and then evaluating. We're evaluating as we go and as things are still in place. And even when the research stops, there'll still be a lot of things happening. And we just assume that. It's not going to be at a set point where the research finishes and then we evaluate. So here's a diagrammatic representation of design-based research going through um, the requirements of what we need to have happen, the various theories that are informing what we're going to explore, the design process we put in place to come up with some sort of artifact that can be implemented and then analyze the effectiveness of it. And then we redesign, we see what we've learned and how it might relate to various theories. And we try to incorporate that understanding and the understanding of these theories into our new redesign. And we continue doing that process until we gain a better understanding of what's occurring. And then we describe that. So design-based research has certain characteristics. Um, it takes us from an unknown and hypothetical design principles. Um, well, sorry, we, we integrate known um, design ideas and hypothetical design ideas, so various research concepts and processes to try to come up with a plausible solution. So we can't come up with any solution. It has to be plausible. It has to be something we've thought about, designed and crafted. Um, and often it is done around an innovative learning environment. And then we rigorously and reflectively try to explore that environment, what's happening with that learning process, happening with that artifact to better understand what's occurring. And then we intertwine the two goals of designing the learning environment, making it as effective as possible and better understanding the learning theories that relate to that environment. Um, it continues to go through a continuous cycle, as we've seen before in other processes we've been exploring, of design, enactment, analysis, and redesign. And it focuses on creating shareable theories. So we're coming up with our understanding of what's happened, relating it to various theories, and we're sharing that as an understanding of what's occurred in this particular instance. And other researchers then can utilize that, or other practitioners can utilize that, those findings to better understand their own research or their own practice. Then we have the research must account for how design functions in authentic settings, the messy classroom settings. Um, it can't be narrowed down to Okay, we're going to have students do this pretest. We're going to keep everything the same. 
and change just one thing. And then we're going to do a post test and see whether or not that one thing we changed had any effect. We assume that in an authentic classroom setting, that's impossible. There's just too many different things happening. The time of day can change things dramatically. Um, how students are feeling in the morning to how they're feeling in the afternoon. Um, what they're learning, how different students react in different ways. So there's just so much complexity in a classroom environment. And finally, a characteristic is around developing these accounts that connect processes of enactment to outcomes of interest. So the way we actually went and did something, the processes we designed to have things happen, comparing that to the outcomes that did happen and how the interesting aspects of those. So we call that connecting the processes of enactment to the outcomes of interest. How did what we designed to do affect various things in terms of outcomes and what was interesting about those? Okay, so again, there's a little video on the course website that explores design-based research that will help you with your understanding of some of these concepts. In comparison, design research versus design-based research. Design research is results-driven. Design-based research is based on prior research, and it's more research-driven. We take our understandings of various theories, and we try to come up with a better understanding of those theories. And in that, it has research goals and empirical results. Um, design research has documentation but the purpose of that documentation is different to design-based research, which is much more around having a comprehensive and cumulative documentation that helps retrospective analysis. Design research is much more around documenting the processes of what is occurring. It's much more observational. Design-based research is much more reflective. And the outcomes of design research are generally not generalizable. While design-based research is designed to be generalizable, we're trying to get a better understanding of these generalizable theories. Design research doesn't attempt to do that. And comparing action research and design-based research, both address real-world problems. Both involve practitioners with the research process. Um, in action research, it's generally initiated by a researcher. In design-based research, it's generally initiated by a practitioner, a teacher or principal or school administrator. Action research is based on theories. Design-based research is based on problems that are being explored. Okay, so that's a little bit of an overview of these various models. And again, you can see a comparison between the two in a video clip that's available on the course website. Now, when you come to tutorial, have ha come ready to discuss um, the differences between action design and design-based research. There's another reading for you to go through that will help you with that process. And also come prepared to discuss how educators can work with researchers to conduct design-based research. Um, and again, in the video with Sasha, it'll take you through and explore that concept in a bit more detail. So, an outcome of design-based research is often some sort of publication. Um, and design-based research generally follows the traditional structure of most research um, in how we present it. It has a literature review, exploring what others have done in the field before, a methodology explaining what you, you've done in your research, the results, what you found out, a discussion of those results. And it can be, though, elaborated into some more com complex structures, just to give you some ideas. Um, this is one basic structure, pretty much as I just said, but it can be done in other ways. In this one, it explores the iterations in a little bit more detail. Or in this one, it breaks it into themes and explores various themes, where in each theme, you look at a question, analysis, and discussion around them. So there's many different ways of presenting research 
Um, these are just some ideas because at the end you're going to be um, exploring your own research proposal. Okay, and there's another video on the course website that briefly goes through and looks at the characteristics of design-based research. Have a look at that and come prepared to discuss the theories that relate to design-based research in relation to educational technologies research and how they can be generalized to other situations and what is currently the key weaknesses of design-based research. Okay, so that's the research aspect of this week. Now we need to contextualize these around educational technologies. You're going to be exploring de design-based research um, around an educational technology intervention. Essentially what that means is we take an educational technology, we implement it in an educational organization, and we research what happens. Um, to do that though, you need to have a bit of a, more of an understanding of what educational technologies exist. Now, if you've done some of the other courses in this series around researching educational technologies or creating educational technologies, you'll have a good understanding of the, the range of educational technologies that are available. If you haven't done those courses or want a refresher on the range of educational technologies that are available, on the course website, I've provided you some links that explain the concept of educational technologies and also um, give examples of a range of different educational technologies. Of course, you're going to need to be able to choose some of these to incorporate into your assessment um, activities. Um, there's also a range of educational technologies interventions. How we use technology and do something with it in an educational organization. Um, and there's a range of different ways we can go about researching that. We've looked at a couple this evening around um, design-based research, design research, and action research, and practitioner research, and things of that nature. But there are lots of others as well. We don't have time to go into them all in this course. We are going into quite a few of them. But to give you a bit of a broader background and overview of the range of different educational technologies research approaches, um, there is an EduTech wiki that um, describes these various approaches. And I encourage you to have a look at that. Okay, so in terms of these types of educational technologies interventions, these represent the ways that we transform educational practice in an organization. And you're going to be using a design based, you're going to be creating a design based research proposal that incorporates social ecological modeling that we're going to explore next week um, in order to develop uh, your proposal. You're then going to use systems modeling where we're going to create a theoretical model um, of your intervention. Um, this all won't happen in, that's the next uh, module. Then you're going to be developing policies around the implementation of that intervention. And then finally, you're going to develop an organizational transformation plan of how your intervention can be actually put into place in an organization. So that's the big picture again of the course and how things are all going to flow together. But it starts with developing a design-based research uh, proposal for an educational technology to be put in place in an organization. So if you're unfamiliar with those, have a look at the Edutech Wiki, and that will give you some ideas around what might be possible around educational technologies. Okay, so your design-based research study proposal is due Monday of week four. Now, again, remember, you can submit it at the end of the course, but in order to receive a mark and get feedback and the opportunity to resubmit if you fail, um, you'll need to submit it by Monday of week four. 